Hi, everyone. This is Amanda Shea. Welcome back to ESG Decoded. I'm really excited to be speaking with Michelle Demers today. She's a founder and CEO of Boundless Impact Research and Analytics. And we're going to be talking about life cycle assessments and how they're helping to scale clean tech investments. Michelle, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here, Amanda. Thank you for making the time. Will you tell everyone a little bit about Boundless? Absolutely. Um, so Boundless Impact Research and Analytics is an environmental research and analytics firm. And we are specialized in rapid life cycle assessments, which I will explain what that means for clean tech companies and investors. And um, we have been doing this for several years now, and we are helping move investment dollars more quickly to the most promising emerging clean tech companies. Uh, uh, and we're also, uh, we believe, helping these companies um, take the friction out of fundraising or customer acquisition or differentiating their products, different ways that they need to actually really be able to demonstrate that their product is different and better and an improvement to the status quo. And we believe that using science to validate performance is an excellent way to just provide those numbers. Um, we're sort of the, I guess you call us the anti-greenwashing because we're just really trying to uh, prove, the, prove the, the, the sustainability story in a compelling data-driven way that companies can use to accelerate their development. There's so much to unpack there. So we're going to, I think, take steps, take it step by step by step. But there's so many things I want to ask you about in just that little intro of what Boundless does. Maybe right. we can start by just, um, we've done a few um, podcast episodes on life cycle assessments or mm -hmm. LCAs, but will right. you give everyone just a quick reminder, a brief overview of, of what is an LCA and how does it differ than uh, a greenhouse gas footprint of, of a company, for example? Sure. Um, so life cycle assessment um, is ISO compliant. It's been around for several decades and it, and it was created in environmental engineering circles as the most reliable way to look at the full uh, environmental footprint of a product throughout its entire life cycle. And GHG footprint is absolutely the North Star metric that all LCAs include, but it isn't the only metric. And we call them EKPIs, Environmental Key Performance Indicators at Boundless. And because some products like batteries, take batteries, for example, you're going to see very similar GHG performance among a lot of batteries. You want to know how toxic are the materials used in the production process? How much water do they use? Um, what's the carbon payback time? What's the levelized cost of electricity? Um, and how does that relate to the commercial viability of the company? And tell me a little bit bit more about your rapid LCA. And I think something sure. that you mentioned is you're the anti-greenwashing. So tell us a little bit more about rapid LCAs and yeah. how how you're preventing that. What I didn't even know there was greenwashing happening in LCAs. I'm please tell us well, more. Well it's not happening in LCA as much as companies are using the word LCA because they're they're they're, mm. they're doing their own LCAs internally and then they're they're not using ISO guided methods such as getting them independently validated by a third party. And so there's a lot of people throwing around the word LCA even now in addition to just classic greenwashing where companies are just self-reporting data. Um, it's important when you do an LCA uh, that you follow certain ISO, uh, ISO principles, such as independently validating data. So we always hire an independent expert, even though we do our LCAs in a matter of weeks versus months. And we're able to do that because we only select uh, the environmental uh, metrics that are the most relevant for a given industry. Um, uh, we still ha hire an independent expert to review the data the company gives us so that we have an independent reviewer. They also do a peer review of our study. We still maintain certain aspects of what is considered ISO compliant LCAs to make sure that companies aren't greenwashing. They're not um, taking an industry 
data point and attributing it to their to their own performance. They're 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 taking the time to actually measure what is the um, energy use in their production process. Where did they source their materials and um, uh, many important factors that go into measuring the product life cycle in, a, in an honest and transparent way. And that, what I'm thinking about is that if you're not following the ISO methodology to its fullest, how do you really know that you're comparing apples to apples? Well, that's right. And, and one of the reasons we're trying to develop this rapid LCA method is we're trying to normalize data a bit by using the same metrics um, within each industry. Certainly can't use the same metrics to measure the environmental performance of an alternative protein versus a, I don't know, a, 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 an electric vehicle battery, because you're talking about different environmental metrics. However, within each of those industries, we're using the same metrics. That isn't always the case uh, with, with LCAs. Oftentimes people are just coming up with, with the metrics that make their product look the best and they're leaving out other important metrics that shouldn't be happening. Um, and then, and then it's, it's, yeah, it's really important to measure apples to apples, like you're saying, so that investors and customers and other stakeholders can understand how one technology compares uh, to another. And that's why we're big evangelists of life cycle assessment methods at Boundless, because we really believe you can do a lot better comparison between companies in terms of understanding their environmental footprint using a product LCA data, which is much more normalized and science-based um, and based in these you know, various metrics that are, that are used in the life cycle community versus scope one, two, three emissions uh, reporting, which are important for reporting and compliance purposes, but they're not gonna be helpful with comparisons between companies in terms of their performance. You mentioned science-based. Can you tell me more about that? That's yep. interesting. I want to. I don't want to understand what you mean by science based. So we uh, we use statistically rigorous life cycle assessment methods uh, in the way that we gather the data and build um, models to assess the validity of a product. Um, we collect the data. We use. Um, we use, as I said, we, we hire and recruit independent industry experts to review the data. We use certain types of assumptions in calculating the, um, the let's say, greenhouse gas footprint or the uh, water, water eutrophication. Um, there's, science is about using, um, using methods that are tried and true and using the same methods to normalize data so you can make comparisons. Um, and we use the same metric and the same unit of measure when we're looking at water eutrophication, which is a water toxicity metric, or we're looking at GHG. And uh, it's really important to abide by certain rules and methods uh, with science. We also, um, we also are, um, uh, real believers in the results being validated and the assumptions that we make behind some of the um, some of the um, uh, technical analysis we do when we're assessing different metrics uh, for different industries that um, that we've had the that we're using other other metrics and other methods that have been used and there's precedent, there's scientific precedent in the literature for those methods um, or for those metrics. Um, there are assumptions that you need to make and there's ways of using science to reduce the uncertainty in an analysis and it, it's using um, uh, something they call sensitivity analysis, which we use in doing life cycle assessment. And that's when there's a higher degree of uncertainty in data, you can, you can start to break things down um, into uh, more digestible parts and do sensitivity analysis around the uncertainty in, in certain aspects of the data. Um, there's all these methods that are in this life cycle assessment approach that are that are really useful for um, 
for companies as well as the investors in them. So for example, without scientific validation or having an independent party review the data, results that companies provide can be too easily skewed to represent only the positive attributes of a company's environmental performance. Um, and, you know, it's, it's important that, um, that things are being measured objectively. I want to understand the difference between um, validation and peer review. Is that the same thing or is that different? So there are two different things. So validation, we use an expert to review the data that the company gives us. And that's one aspect of using of, of, of validation that we do, where they actually review the data that the company gives us and they have no connection to the company. We have other methods for validating the data, such as comparing them to industry benchmarks that we find and doing very rigorous statistical analysis to build those industry benchmarks using primary research. Um, but peer review means that the entire study we've done gets a review by an industry expert in that same industry. And it's just a, another step in the process. So they do both of these things when they do an analysis. Um, they do a review of our analysis. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. I wanted to dig into or ask when you're doing these LCAs, are there ever surprises um, for your for for clients when they're analyzing their product? Yes. And um, surprises yes. is oh, this is a hot spot that we didn't realize, or oh, I guess we didn't think about this right. as much as as being as impactful as it is. Can you talk about some of those kind of aha moments or insights that you're able to deliver? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we were we were assessing a ag biotech company and they were really excited about the impressive performance that their um, biological for crop protection, it was a biopesticide, had a uh, compared to competing technologies in more industrial pesticides in terms of um, not, you know, basically killing bees and pollinators. Like it, we were able to show the data um, and the comparison made their product stand out even more. Um, that's a biodiversity metric or looking at even like water, water toxicity where we are looking at the effect from those chemicals going into the, into the, into the local you know, water rivers and streams and affecting the fish and invertebrate wildlife in the local streams. Um, we were able to show even human toxicity, you know, different types of human toxicity. That was, you know, and, and then if we're assessing a, um, a waste to, you know, fuels company, we can measure things like ocean plastics avoidance. Um, or we can measure, you know, other like microplastics. It's water, water eutrophication can sometimes be measuring the amount of microplastics in water things like that. Um, um, but there's also times when we do these assessments and w companies will be really surprised and disappointed in their GHG performance compared to, um, you know, competitors because they are using more energy in their production process than they realize. Um, they've also, you know, um, done the work of um, analyzing and figuring out where they can use renewable energy in their process. Um, there's different ways that you can reduce your um, GHG footprint. And that is an example of, you know, I mean, we do, we do sometimes uh, do research on competitors as well and um, show that, you know, companies are, are sometimes surprised that their competitors are, that they're closer in performance to their competitors. And so they'll figure out ways that they can tweak their product or their operations to make a bigger difference in how they differentiate their product from their, com from competitors in terms of, um, how to different, you know, um, how to, how they're, if they're if they're an earlier stage company or even if they're not an early stage company, they might be making pretty radical changes as a result of what they learn from the LCA. 
That's one thing I was going to ask you about is typically at what stage of product development or kind of the life cycle of a startup, do they come when is this analysis appropriate? But it sounds like it's really, it could be clean tech startups at all stages. Of, of well, no, not exactly. We don't recommend R and D phase. Mm, clean tech okay. startups do an LCA until they've got enough there, there on their product that, that we can collect data against it. So we turn down customers because we think they're too early. I see. And we, that's when we recommend using these carbon, these, these, what I think are generally overly simplistic carbon calculators that are out in the marketplace. That's not a bad idea for really early stage companies when they need to do some sort of reporting to investors. Then that's the time, you know, the, at that super early stage, we recommend those carbon calculators. There's just not enough data. That's what I'm hearing at those really early stages. You really have to be able to have something to, to share and to, to measure. Right, gotcha. right, exactly. What I know of just, I'll call it a traditional LCA, is all the other environmental performance metrics that you're able to measure. You mentioned some of those before, like the microplastics. Um, in the case of the, um, the, the ag tech company, um, how it was impacting pollinators, bees and other pollinators. That's really on top of what I think of a typical LCA, which is going to look at greenhouse gas emissions, perhaps energy use, maybe water if that's requested. That's really going above and beyond and really helping illustrate the, the complete, let's say, footprint or of, of, of the product. I think that could be really interesting to investors. Yeah, and in Europe, they're already they, they they're already regulating it. So they have something called a product environmental footprint, as well as this European taxonomy, and they are requiring companies and funds to report on other metrics beyond just GHG. They're requiring water uh, reporting on use and um, amounts and you know toxicity in water. They're requiring reporting on air pollution just by way of example. And they have others like in biodiversity and, and toxicity where they've got stricter reporting standards. So there, there are definitely um, new, I would say new regulations that are emerging um, that require beyond just GHG. And we have something in the United States called an environmental product um, declaration which is what sustainable products use to basically get a stamp from the U.S. government. And those require LCAs. Can you talk about a little bit about how investors and funds are using these rapid LCAs? Is it typically during the due diligence process or is it afterward? It's both. Um, but we have had funds that have engaged us to do uh, an assessment as part of their technical diligence. But they're also using them to um, uh, decide on follow-up funding rounds. They're using them to, um, you know, under report on their portfolio's performance uh, when they're going out to raise money from additional LPs, um, or they're using them to report to existing LPs. Um, uh, all of the above. Gotcha. Who would you say um, is or rapid LCA is perfect for? It sounds like clean tech that are a certain stage, certain types of investors as well. What are some other use cases for this that we should know about? I mean, we're working with small and mid-sized public companies that are that are also emerging clean tech companies. They don't have to be private companies. And I definitely think, you know, as I was mentioning, like private equity funds that are that were and VCs where they need to report to their LPs, um, large companies could really use. We're speak, you know, we've worked with some big companies that are not only wanting to analyze their own product, but they're using some of the analytics that we can generate as a result of having done a lot of these assessments over the last five years. We can generate some interesting insights into, let's say they're considering using a different material in a product. We can, we can model out for them what are the types of materials and how do they perform better and how would they perform better on their product. 
And all of those things can be really useful before they take the time to integrate it and spend the money of integrating it into and building a new product. So that those kinds of scenarios that we can do um, using our um, using our data and our analytics can be super helpful. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for coming on our podcast. This is wonderful. Any last thoughts? Any last thoughts that you want to share with the audience? Be skeptical because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of excitement out there. I think in clean tech. I just think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of different types of, of tools out there that are emerging, and um, I'm a little wary of some of the AI-based tools that are doing pure AI and scraping data and not including humans in the analysis. I, I I'm not sure we're there yet. You know, I think you really do need that human review aspect of, of analyzing the data and uh, reviewing it, um, getting an independent expert. It, we, we learn so much from these experts that help us on these assessments. So I would just say like, I know there's all this hoopla about AI and we're even using AI, you know, large language models in and starting to use it in the way we do the searches on these scientific publications. But that said, can't replace the intelligence of human. We're not, we're not there yet because we've been using them. And by the way, there's tons of, they make tons of mistakes, which everyone's finding with chat GPT. Yes. You can use them a little bit and they guide you a little bit, but they're not replacing the human mm -hmm. by any stretch. Mm -hmm. That's what we've seen as well. They're, they're a good um, way kind of to start, but you still need that expert really in the room to as you said, um, be uh, a little bit uh, cautious, uh, have some scrutiny, right. <laughs> scrutinize um, yeah. what those claims right. are really, uh, what are they really claiming and what can we believe here? Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Amanda. Mm -hmm.